So, hey, guys, listen, we're all trying to get more productive. And the question is, how do you find a way to get an edge? I'm a big believer that if you're getting mentoring or you're in an environment that causes growth, a growth-based environment, that you're much more likely to grow and you're going to grow faster. And that's why I love Growth Day. Growth Day is an app that my friend Brendan Burchard has created that I'm a big fan of. Write this down, growthday.com forward slash ed. So if you want to be more productive, by the way, he's asked me, I post videos in there every single Monday that get your day off to the right start. He's got about $5,000, $10,000 worth of courses that are in there that come with the app. Also, some of the top influencers in the world are all posting content in there on a regular basis, like having the Avengers of personal development and business in one app. And I'm honored that he asked me to be a part of it as well and contribute on a weekly basis, and I do. So go over there and get signed up. You're going to get a free, tuition-free voucher to go to an event with Brendan and myself and a bunch of other influencers as well. So you get a free event out of it also. So go to growthday.com forward slash ed. That's growthday.com forward slash ed. There was a lot of opportunities that I was presented with early on that I passed on. This was my passion, being with the WWE. That's what my focus was. Fear is very real. Anxiety is very real. Mm. And all the guys that say, I don't get nervous, yeah. I don't, I'm, it, I, I'm, I'm Iron Man, they're not being honest. How can I find power in this situation? That situation that was supposed to break me that I couldn't change at the moment, maybe God was allowing me to stay in that situation, not to break me, but to build me. We are all flawed. Accept it, use it, learn from it. What's your flaws are what makes you exceptional. They're what make you different. That's mm. what allows you to win where other people don't want to win. I'm curious, I'm a, bi I'm a big boss. Boxing fan. So when you became on my radar was during the Super Six tournament. Yeah. Okay. So that was, and they called that the the, the super middleweight division at the yeah, time, correct? Yeah, super middleweight, 168 pounds. But basically, I'm paraphrasing, Showtime got together and said, let's just find the best one in the world. And they put the six of you in this tournament. It ended up being a seventh dude or something. Wasn't Jermaine Taylor in it originally or what happened Well, there were guys that, like, guys would get knocked out or get injured and then they replaced Place them. But guys. it was That's always, it the was. court was always six. So again, you had Kessler, you had Frock, or Frock, whatever they call them. There's some, <laughs> there's some dudes in this tournament, right? Yeah. And you ended up winning that tournament. I'm curious, when it started at that level, was that a new level for you? And like, did you have fear? Like, did you wonder whether you were the man of those six? Uh, how'd that work for you? I had to drop everything. Hmm. We went, we got in the car, got back to San Diego, flew to the Bay Area, literally dropped my family off, packed a bag, double ear infection, got on a red eye, oh. went to Germany, and was there the next morning to announce the second leg of the Super Six and was this close to not being a part of it. That's crazy. And the way they filmed it, everybody, by the way, th this was so powerful, because all this 24-7 stuff you see now, this is kind of the original of that. Yeah, it was. And it was so well done. It really changed to some extent how boxing was promoted on either Showtime or HBO too, the way they laid it out. But I watched it closely and you weren't the dude they were sort of steering the cameras towards in nah. the beginning. <laughs> and it was really interesting. It was the other guys that I've mentioned before. And I remember you won, then you won again. I'm like, oh, this dude's got a chance to win this whole yeah. tournament. So, so either, every one of these fights, just curious, when you went into it, I, I just want to know how like a world-class person thinks or doesn't think. You're there at that thing in Germany. You see these other five dudes. Are you like, I'm going to win this tournament? Or I've always had that belief. Like, my career was, my professional career was guided um, very meticulously, you know. The powers that be, the networks, the suits, the promoters, like they, they want bang for their buck. They want to make the most money as quickly as possible. And I had opportunities to fight some of the guys that were in the tournament maybe a year or two earlier. And it was for more money than I'd ever seen and, wow. you know, great opportunity. And, you know, I called Vers like, man, they're going to give us, you know, 600000 mm -hmm. And we get to fight on, you know, HBO and this and that or Showtime. And, and he said, no, no. He said, hold on. He said, I understand that, you know, if we say no to this, internally there's going to be some blowback. But he, he said, you know, when we fight these guys, I want you to be a, a full grown man mm. and, and I want you to destroy him. Like, mm. I, I don't want, you know, no, I don't want you to be barely winning or barely eking by. Mm -hmm. And we did that like two or three times before the Super Six happened. No and we get blowback. And some of the blowback spilled publicly mm. where fans are saying, oh, you know, Wards, he's a gold medalist, but he's moving too slow. And mm. that's the heat you take. Yeah. That's the bullseye you have on your back coming in with a mm. gold medal. But in Germany, I really saw what the intent was. Mm -hmm. 
you had Mikkel Kessler, who was Mikkel Kessler at the time. He was like 42 and one or something mm-hmm. like that, but like, I don't know how many knockouts. Mm-hmm. He had more knockouts than I had fights. fights. You had Carl Frotch, yep. who was from the UK, and you had Arthur Abraham, and then you had oh, the three Abraham Americans. Right, Abraham. Jermaine Taylor, who was teetering. He was yep. still relevant, but he was teetering mm-hmm. on, on, on kind of being done. Mm-hmm. You had the young guy, Andre Durrell, and then you had the other young guy and myself. And I could tell that Everybody that was there, they just looked at us like we were just a token just to be there. Like, mm-hmm. these guys will make it interesting. Mm-hmm. Some namesake, young guys coming up. But these guys, these yeah. are the guys that are supposed to win. Yes. And I took exception to that. To the personal. I took exception to that. And I got on the phone. I called Vert. I said, man, they don't, they don't really expect me to win this. Mm-hmm. He said, oh, yeah, I, I know. Mm-hmm. He said, it's always been like that. Mm-hmm. He said, but just watch. Mm-hmm. Unwavering faith. He's always yeah. that pillar. And, and again, that jumped off on me. It's already confident, but now, now it was personal. Mm. Now it was personal. Your physiology changes so dramatically. You go into your Virgil you thing, you go into your dad, yeah, 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 like, you can see it, you can <laughs> see it, you can see it. And at that time, Kessler and Frotch were like rock stars in their various countries too, right? They were big names and at real the time. Quick, I don't blame anybody for not picking us. Like right. I probably wouldn't have picked me. I was a young mm. guy. Yeah, I had the gold medal, but I hadn't, I hadn't done anything as a, as a pro. Mm. My biggest win was a guy named Edison Miranda, who was a beast. He mm. was a top contender, mm. right? Yeah. That was my biggest win okay. as a professional. So I don't blame anybody for not picking me, but I was also going to use that as fuel and ammunition <laughs> as well. This. I was going to use this. it. So he goes on to win that like he wins everything else. You know, the other thing you said through, I just want to hear everybody, everyone just hear things I hear that I think are important. I do think that there are times in your life where if you don't jump on an opportunity, you will regret it the rest of your life. That there is timing to when you win. Oh there gosh. are moments, and yeah. you've said this a few times where Virgil said this to you. And for a lot of you that are chasing what you're chasing, you may get fatigued of that chase, but there's gotta be this part that goes, if I don't jump on this now, this may never come again for me. So your timing is so critical on winning this Super Six tournament, was a huge catalyst. Now let's talk some boxing stuff just for me because yeah, yeah, I want to know some it, stuff. Okay. I'm curious, mm-hmm. uh, when you, I, I told you I was going to ask you this and you haven't told me the answer so I'm curious. Forget the training part just for a second, we're going to get to that. You are getting wrapped. You're about to go out yeah. okay, for a big fight. Yeah, you're yeah. getting wrapped up. I'm sure Virgil's talking to you. You're going through whatever your game plan was. What goes through you? Is there honest emotions here as a fighter? See, the thing about boxing to me is that it's different than every other sport. UFC has some of this as well, but the, the, the combat sports. This is a man and a man. Mano I, think, y mano. I think people forget this. Like, even when you bat as a baseball hitter, there's another dude coming up after you. Yeah. If you ground out, the other dude could get the hit, right? Yeah. This is a man and a man. And I'm just curious, when you have that happening, you're getting, look at your physiology changed again, right? <laughs> but I'm just curious, like, when you're getting wrapped at that moment, what's going through you emotionally? What are you, what's happening to you at that time? That moment can break a lot of men. Mm. You can have a great training camp. Uh, everything could be clicking. You could have a great fight week leading up to that moment. And that moment, as well as the walk to the ring, mm-hmm. you can lose it. Like you can lose your confidence, you can let fear overtake you, um, and you can somehow convince yourself that you're not worthy to be there in that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost like an out of body experience. You hear people say, you know, a guy froze, or you know, he didn't, he didn't perform, or it was a deer in the headlights. Like that's what they're talking about. Like you have, it's almost like a surreal moment, like this, this moment that you've been prepping for, talking about, building up to, the world has been talking about, like it's here, and the fact that it's actually here, like it hits you in a, in, a, in, a, in a different kind of way, like you're getting wrapped, and you have the commission from whatever state you're fighting, they're coming in, they're checking on you, they're giving, they're giving you the countdown, we got 45 minutes, we got 30 minutes, we got 20, then they come back in after you get your, your, uh, your gloves back on, and they, and they say, we got five minutes, mm-hmm. we're walking in two and a half minutes, mm-hmm. and they start to count you down, like whether you train, good or not Mm. that's running through your brain Mm. thinking about my wife and my kids Mm. i'm thinking about the fact that the whole world is literally going to be watching me in just a few moments i'm thinking about my critics they got a front row seat Mm. they got a front row seat thinking about my supporters and the people that are, are riding with me getting behind me they got a front row seat they're watching they're pulling for me it's like this, like this controlled chaos that's going on, and it's literally an arena. It's, it's a, it's a, with two gladiators getting ready to literally risk it all. Like boxing is the only sport 
professional sport that I know of that one loss can change your pay scale. Mm. Like it's in the contract. If you lose a fight, your minimums can change. We can renegotiate those minimums. Mm. Like that's what's going through my head. Wow. And fear is very real. Really? Anxiety is very real. Mm. It's very present. Mm. And all the guys that say, I don't get nervous. Yeah. I don't, I'm, it, I, I'm, I'm Iron Man. Yeah. They're not being honest. Is that right? Like that's very, very present. But that's where my faith, I knew yours, comes in. Mm. And I start to believe beyond myself. I start to believe beyond the way that I'm feeling. Like we're called to walk by faith and not by sight. We're called to walk by faith and not by feeling. Mm. So fear is present. But courage is going in the midst of fear. And I've had 32 fights before I retired. And I had to do that every single time. It's not mm. like, oh, this is the 25th time I've done this. It's easy. Mm. Because one punch mm. can change your pay scale. One punch can change your life. Mm. And you're not guaranteed mm. to walk out the same way you walked in. Mm -hmm. So all of that is going through oh your mind, running through your body. And you got to channel it. You got to process it. And you got to believe and you got to be unwavering. And one thing I would always do was I would kind of just pace the locker room. And even though my team's in there, even though the commissioner's coming in and out, and again, it's like controlled chaos. Mm -hmm. Television cameras are in your face. Producers are walking around. You hear the crowd. You hear the announcer. I would just talk to myself. It's my night. Mm -hmm. It's my night. I'm not going home without my belts. Like those types of things, they may seem corny to some people, but that stuff would really lift me up. Mm -hmm. And because a made up mind is a hard thing to break. Mm. And your mind has to be made up. <laughs> Not walking to the ring mm. or when you step through those ropes, your mind has to be made up before you leave that locker room that mm. I'm not gonna be broken. Oh. I will not lose tonight. Oh my gosh. You ever get, uh, you ever get there where you're at the stare down and look at a dude and know you got him? Has that ever happened? Or is it on a professional level you just don't know? Does it ever happen the reverse where you're in that state, you're in that faith state, you're in that strong state, and you've looked, you're like, oh, I got this fool. Does that ever happen? You have to tell me who. Most times, no. Okay. Because as fighters, we can lie. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're good chameleons. Mm -hmm. Because in the sport of boxing, if you show weakness, yeah. the opponent's going to pounce. So we hide a lot of our emotions. You know, you got some guys that are scared to death, and they, they'll, they'll, they'll put a mask on. Mm. There's one time, one time in a 32 fight career that I knew I had a guy mm. at the weigh-in, Chad Dawson. You knew, and you even told me who it was. And he, by the way, Chad Dawson's a great fighter, yes, but you knew. How'd you know fighter. him, why'd you know? He, <laughs> so you get a lot of rumors and you hear a lot of hearsay mm. in training camp. Yeah. This guy, you know, they'll call mm. my coach, and I stayed away from that stuff, but my coach always had his ear mm -hmm. to what was going on with my opponent. And he would decide on what he, would, what he wanted to share and what he wouldn't want to share. The guy, Edison Miranda, that I just told you about, mm -hmm. he was sparring with Chad Dawson to help Chad Dawson get ready for our fight. Big fight, Chad Dawson was the, the lineal light heavyweight champion, had just beat the, the great legendary Bernard Hopkins. Southpaw. The, the fight before, yes. Yeah. Tall, rangy. Yeah. He beat Bernard Hopkins, he's on HBO. Max Kellerman asked him, you know, Chad, what do you want next? I'm minding my own business. He calls my name. I just won the Super Six. He said, I want Andre Ward. He said, I'll fight him in his hometown of Oakland, California, and I'll go down to his weight, too. And I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I like Chad. Like, I supported mm. Chad and didn't see that coming. Mm. That was like the easiest fight that we ever negotiated right there. Yeah. And I held him to every single word that he spoke. <laughs> every word. Hey, come my weight, my place. So they get into training camp, and because he's losing so much weight, mm. his punch resistance isn't there. Mm. Edison Miranda can crack. Edison Miranda knocks him out in sparring. Yeah, in sparring. Stuff starts to circulate. Mm. Verge comes to him, he said, listen, babe. He's called me babe. Listen, <laughs> babe. I'm not saying this to get you off track. We gotta stay focused. We're probably about two and a half, maybe three weeks away from the fight. Maybe about two and a half. He said, I'm hearing some things, man. I'm hearing that, that, that Edison Miranda, he knocked Chad out. I said, knocked him out. Mm -hmm. He said, knocked him out. Like they had to stop the sparring, help him up, and that was it for the day. Now, if you're a fighter, like 
that's like the worst case scenario. Yeah. It's one thing if you get knocked out in a fight. You got small gloves on, no headgear, it yeah. happens. That's acceptable yeah. in some respects. In sparring, mm. nah, okay. nah. Not if you're the top dude. Mm. There may be a sparring partner getting knocked out, mm -hmm. but not the top guy, not the champion. That was a no-no. We started hearing rumors, some kind of process. I'm like, man, he got knocked down. Man, that's crazy. But in my mind, I'm always very much in my head, especially in training camps. I'm like, ah, maybe they're just floating that out there to get in my head or trying to get me off track. And that's what Verge said. He said, but don't, don't, you know, don't, don't worry about it too much. Just, you know, stay focused. We kept hearing stuff, kept hearing stuff. Nothing ever went on the airwaves. Nothing, nothing on the internet, nothing. Press conference came the week of the fight. I'm thinking, man, I wonder if they're going to say something. So a rumor is going to come out if I'm going to be asked about it. It's never asked about it. The weigh-in comes. Friday, the fight Saturday. I said, now I'm gonna drop it on him. Now I'm gonna drop it on him. We go face to face. And his team, they're over there woofing. My team's kind of woofing a little bit. And I leaned in his ear and I said, hey man, I heard what happened in that gym. <laughs> I said, you better tighten it up tomorrow night. And you just see his shoulders just go. Oh and he's got this look on his face like, how did you know? <laughs> I won the fight with Chad Dawson right there. Oh my gosh. We turn awesome. and look at the cameras, turn back and look at him before I walk off the stage. Mm. He, I broke him. Just you like just that. knew. Broke him. That is because an he, awesome he story. He thought he got away with it. He you thought we didn't know it. <laughs> it's too late. You can't get out of the fight now. That is awesome, man. That, so that was the awesome. only time I ever felt like I won a fight when I what did a face time? off. Thank you for all of that insight of that and what it's like getting wrapped. Like, I don't thank know if you I've ever me. told that story before. And it's awesome. Well, we're keeping it in whether you want to or not. <laughs> I'm keeping that one in there. No, we, we do too much. So uh, you said that one punch. A couple more things on boxing, then we'll, we'll sh shift because we're going to run out of time. But like, I could go three hours of this. But you said that one punch. Who's who, hardest you ever been hit by who? Hey, hey, hey. I would say it's tough to say one guy, but I would probably say. The guy with the the, the strongest power, mm -hmm. the two guys with the strongest power, are Arthur Abraham, okay. and I heard rumors about him. Mm -hmm. The analogy people always gave was he, he feels like he's got bricks in his gloves. Mm -hmm. And if you watch the, my first fight with him, the only fight that we had in the first round, he hit me with a jab. A jab. And for those that don't know, that's a basic punch mm -hmm. in boxing, just a straight, mm -hmm. straight punch. Wow, he hit me and I, and I kind of buckled a little bit. Mm. I said, oh boy, it's real. Mm. Everything they said was real. Mm. And that kept me on my toes and kept me on my game mm. the whole night. And then Edison Miranda, he hit like a mule. Mm. Uh, his, his money punch was the right hand. That's pretty much all he had. He pawed mm. with the jab. Mm -hmm. He had these long arms. And if he, got, if he landed that right hand flush, a lot of guys went to sleep. Mm. Um, and that was my first time facing a big puncher like that. Mm. And that's probably the worst I've ever felt after a fight was fighting Edison Miranda. Those two guys probably had the most devastating okay. power. So I thought you were gonna say, and we'll wrap up the boxing piece here. I thought you were gonna tell me Kovalev. So, I love your face when I said that. So, for those of you who don't know, so I'm a huge fan of yours, you know this, but I'm, now that we're friends, I need to tell you <laughs> that before you fought him, you a little worried? I was worried for you. <laughs> so I thought, this is the crusher. Yeah. This, this dude supposedly can really hit, right? And right. so, so y'all don't know this, he, he beat him twice. And, but, but so just, cause those are the last couple fights, right? Yeah, so just, last two fights. what would you just tell me about fighting him, prepping for him, getting hit by him, those fights, anything you would tell me about the, those experiences? I mean, the first get, fight was like, Hey, it was, uh, people thought it could have gone either way. way. The second fight, there was obviously no question. Yeah, no, I mean, Kovalev was like, he's a real deal. He's a real deal. Anytime you got a nickname like the Crusher, yeah. you better be able to hit hard. Mm -hmm. and, and he has good power. He has good power. It's not what I thought it was, mm -hmm. um, but, but he hits hard. And I, I think one thing that's always been overlooked in my career, you hear about, you know, people saying, oh, he's a good boxer. You know, Dre, you know, he can, he can do this, he can do that. But they never talk about my chin. And that's not really something I want to be known for. Because you don't want to get hit all the time. Hey, right? I'm not, that's not right. really not my thing. But, it. like, I fought the best punchers in the game. Mm -hmm. And... I've been down twice in a 32 fight career mm. and I fought the best. And one of those times was against Sergey Kovalev. Mm -hmm. um, I can't get into too much because we're, you know, we're going to be putting out the documentary soon and yes. we're going to detail um, a lot of what happened 
in, in the pre-fight for Kovalev one, but just went through a lot of different things physically for that fight. Um, I was moving up in weight from 168 pounds to 175 pounds. But again, I, like you just mentioned, I'm not going up there mm -hmm. just to fight some Rudy Poo. I'm yeah. fighting the best guy. This guy was the real deal. Yeah. Um, Russian fighter. Um, he was known for going into other people's hometowns and home countries and like taking their belts. Yep. And nobody really wanted to fight him. And here I am, a guy that's in a lower weight class who's not really considered a big puncher, um, but has a lot of skill. And I've pretty much won everything at the lower weight class. And people are saying, man, he's going up in weight. Like the, the overall consensus was the critics were saying he bit off too much. Yeah. This is the guy that's finally going to get him. Yep. And my supporters were saying Dre's going out boxing. We get into the fight, and the first thing I noticed about him was just how accurate he was. Hmm. Like, it wasn't necessarily that he hit hard. It was just, he was just very accurate. Like, I was thinking, and he was punching. Hmm. And the first round was just like, man, it was just like a blur. And I remember sitting down, and Verge getting on me right away, saying, man, stop posing. Meaning, stop standing hmm. still. Like, move your legs. Hmm. Like, warm up. Get hmm. moving. And I was just kind of like, man, I just, I, I don't know. I just kind of felt like I was in quicksand. Second round, he and I exchange, and I'm getting ready to throw a right hand. He's getting ready to throw a right hand, and his right hand gets there first. And I just see a flash, bam. I look up, oh, man, I'm on the canvas. Mm -hmm. I hear the crowd going crazy. I look up, the referee's in my face, six, seven, eight. And I stand up. In those moments, we talked about pre-fight, but in that moment, that's for sure a fight or flight type moment. Yeah. Like, whatever you got on the inside, it's going to come out. If you got turn in you, it's going to come out. Mm -hmm. If you got any kind of coward in you, it's going to come out. If you got the dog in you, that's going to come out too. And I thank my dad for these types of moments because my dad had that dog in him. And he's the type of guy that would never start anything, but if you hit him, he's going to hit you back. And that was probably the best thing that could have happened to me in that first fight with Kovalev was for me to get knocked down because now I'm mad. Mm -hmm. Now I want to get that back. Hmm. And I'm no longer overthinking, trying to be perfect. Like, I was too busy. I was incensed with trying to get that moment back from him. And I found somehow, some way, man, by the grace of God, I clawed my way back into that fight. And I really felt like from the seventh round on, um, I broke him. Hmm. And when I say broke him, it doesn't mean that he quit. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that he threw in the towel. It means that he wasn't himself. Mm -hmm. I stopped him from being who he wanted to be that mm -hmm. night. And I eked out a win. Yeah. And I won the fight by the 12th round. If I'm not mistaken, two judges gave That's it to me. That's correct. One judge gave it to him. One judge gave it to him. And uh, some people were not happy about That's it. That's right. Yeah. And, and some people were happy about it. And after the fight, I thought I was done. Mm. I thought I was done. Uh, I think it was a combination of just my career, like mm. the physical toil that it took to get ready for fights and then the actual fights. And then you see the reaction from the people and it's like, man, I just gave my all. I just beat yeah. the boogeyman, I beat the monster yeah. and it's still not enough. Mm. And I didn't do anything for three months after that fight and that's a no-no for me. Like I, I always do something. I'll take, you know, maybe three, four weeks off, mm -hmm. let my body heal and then yeah. I'll start to do some run-in, some mm -hmm. light shadow box and I'll get back in the gym little by little. I like had no desire, like literally for three months straight. And I remember going to see my pastor, Napoleon Kaufman, former Raider running back. Really? He's yeah, your pastor? That's my pastor. He go, did he go to Notre Dame or Navy? No, he went to UW, University of Washington. That's right. Okay, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah. That's right. From Lumpo. I remember him. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I remember going to him and, you know, he, he abruptly retired after yeah. six years in the league and started a church and he's been doing great. I said, man, Pastor, I don't know, man. I said, I, I think I'm done, man. He said, man, why do you say that? I said, I haven't done anything in three months. I said, that's not like me. I have no desire to do this. And I thought he was going to co-sign with me. Yeah. And he kind of sat there like he did. He said, you know, Dre, I, he said, I think you'll be fine if you stop right now. He said, but I, I can see you doing one more. Mm -hmm. And I remember, like, I was thankful for what he told me, but at the same time, I was disappointed. I'm like, like, what? <laughs> Wait a <laughs> second. You're supposed to give me that extra right. little oomph to, like, right. give me the courage to walk away. Yeah. And he challenged me. He said, man, I can see you doing one more. I said, really? I said, but yeah, but I just told you I have no desire to do it. I haven't been to the gym. He said, I know, I know. He, says, he said, but once you make up your mind that you want to do the second fight, he said, the fire will be rekindled. Mm -hmm. And he just sat there. And I got up and I walked out. And again, I had mixed emotions. I was like, man, I appreciate him. 
man, that wasn't what I thought he was going to say. Mm. And he challenged me just to go a little bit longer, go a little bit further. And I was content, even though I knew I was going to get some heat and people were going to say, you're running from Kovalev, you lost the first fight, you're scared to fight the second fight. I knew I was going to get that, but I was over it. Mm. Drove home and talked to my wife and mulled over for, for about another week. And I picked up the phone. I told my team, I said, man, get the money right. I said, we'll do the second fight. Mm. Mm. And just like that. The desire kicked the, back uh, It did come back. You trained just as rigorously for that fight as any I other fight. I had the best training camp for that fight than I probably ever had in my whole career. I was the happiest. Hmm. Um, I just enjoyed it again. Okay. The first fight, physical issues, it was just a lot of pressure. Like, it was just a lot. It just didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. But once I got through that and got to this other side, Man, I had a great camp, man, I was happy. Yeah. I had the bounce back in my legs, my body was, felt good. I just mentally, I, like me and Verz had planned to knock him out. Mm. That was the first thing Verz said when I went back to the gym, he said, we gonna stop him. And in my mind, I'm like, all right, how? Like, yeah. give, give me the how. <laughs> That's the what, what's yeah. the how? He said, we gonna hit him to the body. Mm. He said, you broke him that second half of that fight, he was exhausted. Mm. He said, we gonna pick up where we left off. Mm. And the camp was just amazing. It was amazing. Amazing. Like we had, you know, bumps and bruises, but that was the best camp emotionally that I've had in a long, so long time. So that leads to the big question. Like, he retired. By the way, if you want to see something, it's unbelievable. So this was a dominant win, okay? I think your best fight, myself, because of who it was against, too. But So you want to see an emotional clip. Go to his Instagram, which we're going to promote at the very end. We're going to promote some things here in a minute that I want you all to see that are awesome that he's doing. But let me just be clear with you. You need to go watch this video. It's, it's emotional to watch. I told him I got teary-eyed watching it alone, right? But so you lost a little of your juice after the first fight. You found it. Then he retired after this fight. Okay. But like, still the dominant fighter that you are. Like, why not fight again? Do you know you're not going to fight again? And, or is there the chance that something like that happens again and that fire gets rekindled and we see you back in the ring again? Because he walked in there and I'm like, this dude is fit. I mean, ready I'm to trying. go. It's been a year Friday that he yes. decided to retire, but yeah. like, really? Yeah. You know how boxers are, like really? Now he's saved some money, he's not your normal boxer, yeah. but be real, like is there a door open? I know you can't, like is it cracked open? Is it possible the right dude came along? called you out whatever like be don't don't do the tv answer do the real answer like is there a chance that you would fight again listen it's not something i'm planning you know it's not something i'm planning it's not something that's being mapped out mm -hmm. um but i'm also smart enough to know that you don't know how things are going to unfold you just don't know. Mm -hmm. So I'm always going to keep myself in some kind of shape. Yeah, you're smirking. I'm always keep my eye on the game and just see who's who mm -hmm. and what's going on. Um, but I'm not planning on it. Mm -hmm. Like, the why is what we're going to address in my upcoming documentary. Yeah. Unguarded. Let's talk about that. And I named it Unguarded because my harshest critic will say that Andre's guarded. He doesn't give you anything. Mm -hmm. And... Some of that is true, but a lot of them haven't taken the time to ask why. Like, we just met. Mm -hmm. I followed you, I know your body of work, um, but I feel like I can talk to you. Thank you. you know, it's kind of like a kindred spirit there. Yes. So you want to open up to a person like that. And sometimes the media, they come off abrasive and they've, they kind of want the story for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. And based on my upbringing and everything that I've had to go through, like I'm, I'm sensitive with my story, man. And I'm sensitive with my whys and I'm sensitive with all those things. And this is one of the first times that I'm going to like really open up and not just open up, but like show people uh, why the best fighter at that time a year ago walked away from from tens of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and without giving too much away, like. Of course, you know, there's a lot of factors. There's, there's, you know, wanting to preserve my long-term health. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm dealing with physical issues. I've had multiple surgeries and, and, and I've, you know, to use your line, like I've, I've maxed out. Mm -hmm. Like I poured myself out. Mm -hmm. Like I've literally given everything that I was supposed to give. Like when I jumped rope, I gave it everything I had. When I shot up box, I gave it everything I had. And liter literally to the point where my coaches had to pull me back. Mm -hmm. and say, man, don't leave it all in here. Like that's all I know is to give it everything I have because like I, I've, had a 20-year win streak since I've been a baby, 14 years old. 
And that doesn't come easy. Yeah. And yes, I can have the faith in God. And yes, I can have all that stuff. But faith without works is dead. Yeah. Yeah. And I put in that work. So I got to a point where I said, there's only a handful of guys that have walked away like this. A handful. And there's even a smaller percentage of guys that left undefeated. And I didn't just pad my record and then say I'm undefeated. Like I fought the best, yeah. the best available competition. And I just woke up one day and I had tens of millions of dollars on the table. Mm -hmm. And I told my wife, I was like, I don't, I don't want to do this no more. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to do this no more. And I said, and even me saying it like it's taboo. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to say that as a, as a professional athlete mm -hmm. more, and, and more importantly, a fighter. Mm -hmm. Because when you start using the R word, mm -hmm. the writing's on the wall. Yeah. It's time to go. And uh, she said, babe, if you're saying that, I feel like the decision is already made. Mm -hmm. And you know you got my full support. And um, the video that you just mentioned, for some reason that video was in my head. Like I had it, I said, man, I want my, and those boys that were in the video were my sons. Oh, wow. I, didn't like that. I said, I want to show people like my career at each stage mm -hmm. as a young kid and then, you know, young teenager and then, you know, older teenager. And then I want to let them know that I accomplished everything that I set out to accomplish. I got people that love me. I got, I got critics, you know, but I've done it all that I wanted to do. I've made enough money. Um, I'm ready to go. Yeah. And there's a piece of this decision that was for me, but then there's also a piece that was for the sport that I love, a sport that I've given, given up a childhood for and given my life to. You know, fighters are not always revered. When you say certain fighters' names, you get a certain reaction. When you bring up the name boxing and you don't love the sport like you, mm -hmm. Most people's reaction is, ah, you know, mm. and they have something negative to say after that. And one thing that they always say is, ah, you know, those fighters, man, you know, they hang on too long. Mm. And I went to Canastota, New York, about three years ago to the International Boxing Hall of Fame. And it was such a, it was a rewarding moment. It was a, it was an awesome moment. I'm seeing fighters that I grew up watching and I'm talking to them and we're getting at each other like, man, I ought to beat you, man, you're too small. And we just had a great two or three days. Then I also saw the ones that, that neurologically weren't mm -hmm. good mm -hmm. or maybe didn't have the money, tangible, yeah. you know, proof of what they did all these years. And it bothered me. Mm -hmm. And Ed, I don't want to I didn't want to be another one of those guys. Mm -hmm. Like when is enough enough? Yeah. Like you can always say there's more money out there. But the question that me and my wife kept asking ourselves is what do we do with what we had? Yeah. With what was in our already in our hands. Yeah. And since I retired, don't get me wrong. Like, I missed the boxing checks. Because mm -hmm. they were plentiful. Sure. They, they were large. Yes. Um, but, but they come with a price. Yeah. And I just wasn't willing to put my, put my body through that anymore. And again, I'm a person that, that gave it all I had or I don't want to do it at all. And if I can't give it all I have and if I don't think my body's going to respond like I needed to, I don't want to wait until some young guy has to show me that I don't have it anymore. I'd rather leave on top and try to set an example for the next generation and say, man, you know what? I'm gonna do the Andre Ward. Oh, wow. You just have this overabundance of character. Thank and you, so man. that's what overflows from you, right? And I do believe in life, there's these chapters of our lives. And I think, you know, and I wanna make sure that everyone knows about this documentary too, is like, that's one of these chapters, just the preview alone is just gripping. It's like unbelievable. I can't wait for this to get out into the into the world. And you're turning the page. And one of the things about you, because your character is so, uh, by the way, selfishly, I hope as you keep turning these pages that sometime over the next two or three years again, the, the, the chapter turns where you feel the desire to do that or should do it. But I admire and respect you for not doing it too because there is so much to be said to be finishing the way that you have. And because of your character, because of your composure, your elegance, the way you communicate, you have a lot of other opportunities outside Man, of boxing you. too. You've had an injury that ended a career like we both had, right? Or whatever. That is not changeable. It's it, it, that is a, it's a fact of life. It happened, or there was a divorce or you had a bankruptcy or a business failed or someone did you wrong. So you talk often about being able to not change the situation, but change potentially the way that you what? So go ahead. I'll let you, mm. I'll let you answer that. That's so powerful, Ed, because I get that question all the time. It's like, yeah, I can't so change. Right. Or even teenagers are saying, yeah. I can't, I'm in my parents' household. I can't yes. get out of this household. I can't do this. 
And if that's the truth, if you can't change the situation, you must change your mindset mm. in the situation. Mm. You must change your mindset towards the situation. You must change who you are mm. in the situation. And that's called perspective. Some I talk about all the time. Your perspective can be your prison or it can be your power. And so any situation that I know that I can't undo, I mean, even with my mother's passing, mm -hmm. I can't change that. That's a situation I have forever. I can allow that pain to control me or I can say, you know what, I can do something with this pain and, 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 and manipulate it to make it my power. And so I'm always thinking now, OK, how can I find power in this situation? You talk about the word for the year, right? One of my words I always say is this or mantras is this is power. When I can't change situations, this is power, because at some point I know I'm going to look back and say, man, that situation that was supposed to break me that I couldn't change at the moment. Maybe God was allowing me to stay in that situation, not to break me, but to build me. Mm. And I can look back plenty of times in my life and say, man, I'm glad I stayed in that or I'm glad that happened because now it created something inside of me that if I would have moved from that situation, or I didn't have that situation. Mm. I wouldn't have the experience. I wouldn't have the knowledge and I wouldn't have the strength from it. Yeah. Now I want to stay on that because most people know your story, but maybe they need to be right. Many may not, you know, people that are new to my show or, or new to you, but this whole thing that you are, this man you've become was really born out of a situation you couldn't change with your friend, right? Like the beginning of this version of Trent Shelton. And I think it's probably a great time in the show for you to tell that story because I think there's a lot of people they're in situations they can't change right now, combined with the fact that they're not sure what their purpose is or what their passion is or what to do about it. And you've become one of the biggest influencers in the world through what most people would view and was a tragedy with a friend of yours. So take everyone through that part of your story. It's the perfect time in the show, because I think they can see themselves in your story, even though the situations are different. Absolutely. Uh, I was a college teammate, college roommate, um, even more than that, one of my closest friends in college. Um, his career got cut short, football player. And what I mean, got cut short. He went through some trials, some relationship things. He mm -hmm. left a uh, football team and, you know, he joined the military and nothing wrong with that. But I just know that for him in conversations, he was selling. He was unhappy just being around him. I could just tell something was different. 2011, uh, I got a call. Uh, one night I was actually on my way to our other best friend's house. And it's ironic because me and my best friend were just talking about him. It's like, man, we need to link up with Ant. Got a call from a girl who actually knew us at Baylor, but she was in the corner. She worked at the corner's office. She said, hey, Trent, uh, Ant is here. And I didn't put two and two together. I was like, okay, like where? Like, is he, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, where is he at? He's like, he's here. And I was like, what are you talking about? It's like, I work at the corner's office. He's here. And it still didn't register. Mm. Make a long story short, Ant had committed suicide. Um, mm -hmm. They found him three days later uh, with all the memories in front of him, pictures of people, um, you know, his football things. And, you know, he shot himself in the head. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, uh, it hurt because, you know, when you lose somebody, the first thing you go to is guilt. The first thing you go to is regret and ask yourself, man, I wish I would have. I wish I would have done more. And in that moment, I knew that there was nothing I could have done more, mm -hmm. you know, since the situation had happened. Uh, I remember going to his service, man. And, and I'm glad that you said this because being a speaker, being whatever people want to call me, titles, author, all the stuff that people give me, this wasn't something that I wanted to do. Yeah. This wasn't something that I sought out to say, hmm, this is a great business idea. Let me do this. Yeah. No, nah, it wasn't. It was my promise to him at his funeral. My promise. And I love when you say, man, you know, keeping that promise to yourself is yeah. so, so important. My promise to him was like, Aunt, I'm going to live the rest of my life to help people with their self-worth. So when people see my videos and they say, Trent, man, like you talk about releasing things from your life or getting rid of toxic things from your life. This is why. Yes. Because he had toxic things in his life that he felt like he had no life anymore. Hmm. And he felt like there was no reason to go on. Hmm. And so with my promise to him, and from that day, I started picking up my cell phone, didn't have a following, started making these videos with just this, yes. didn't have some camera that you're seeing now, didn't have no microphone, just my cell phone. Yes. And I committed myself for the rest of my life. And, and I want to be clear about that, Ed, because I just feel like we live in a generation now where I don't want to step on any, or I don't mind stepping on people's toes, but I, I don't want to, you know, make people feel a certain type of way by saying this and you know, hopefully y'all have, you know, you have your insecurities to the side, but a lot of people, you know, when they sign up for certain things, 
is for external reasons. It's because they see Ed Milet mm-hmm. with, you know, this following. They see Trent Shelton with this, but they don't know what we have endured and what we still endure while we're going through it. That's right. And they don't have a deep rooted reason of why they want to do what they do. And every time opportunity to quit, opportunity to throw in the towel, opportunity to detour to something else, to, to change, you know, there's people that's on there. And, and I, I want to be clear. It's OK to, you know, change different things. But if you're just changing because it's hard, because things ain't adding up, because you're not getting the likes and the views and the money, all that stuff. I see a lot of that. And for yeah. me. I said, there's no negotiation with this. Yes. Like I'm yes. burning the boats, burning the bridge, and I'm signing yeah. up for this forever. So yes. every time I want to quit, man, I I picture his face. Yeah. And um, it makes me go even harder. I, I hope everybody just hears what he just said. I mean, it's it's easy to hear it in hindsight. This guy's a f- Trent's a football player, right? And kind of then trying to find where what am I going to do with my life? Imagine this that because of this tragedy in his life, a situation, as we said in the previous you know, conversation, wasn't controllable. And he ends up becoming, through grabbing his cell phone and just starting to talk about this stuff, one of the biggest influences on the planet, hundreds of millions of views, probably over a billion if you added up all your content now, you know, all of it combined, right? One of the most sought after speakers on the planet, podcaster, author, guy I've had on, I've had, I think, th- three people on my show only two times. He's one of them. And that gives you an idea of how highly I regard Trent. And a lot of you that are listening to this, if you're thinking, I don't know what my passion is, here's a place to look. And it's not always there. Look for a real pain point for you. It's a really, it's not always there, but you go, what's a real pain point? Like for me, my dad was an alcoholic, my low self-esteem. That's the pain point of my life has become my work. That's that thing Trent just used, deep rooted reason to keep going when you're not successful originally. That's why this pain, he always says, has turn it into a purpose. That's usually where your purpose is coming from is a place of pain from you. That's why you see some of these influencers that are super fit that used to be super heavy. It was a pain point. I just left my place in Maine, my favorite time of year, which is the fall. Autumn leaves are beautiful. By the way, they're everywhere on my property right now. They're beautiful until they clog your gutters. So whether you're tired of unclogging your gutters or you don't even know what your gutters look like, like I don't, it's time for a permanent solution that you can depend on with Leaf Filter. Right now, you can save up to 30% off your entire purchase at leaffilter.com slash ed. If you're someone like me who doesn't like to do a lot of work around your house, I'm telling you right now, you got to address this leaf issue. I literally had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for something that would be so inexpensive with Leaf Filter had I just taken advantage of it in the beginning. So trust me, I'm a big fan of Leaf filter. Every installation comes with a lifetime no clog guarantee. Protect your home and never clean out your gutters again with Leaf Filter, America's number one gutter protection system. Schedule your free inspection and get up to 30% off for your entire purchase at leaffilter.com slash ed. That's a free inspection and get up to 30% off at leaffilter.com slash ed. See representative warranty for details. If you listen to this show for a while, you've heard me and my guests talk a lot about how critical it is to have your wellness goals in order, especially lately with me. So you know how powerful visualization is. When you visualize yourself 1, 10, 30 years from now, you've achieved all your goals. Ask yourself this, am I healthy at that point? In your visions, of course you are. But like anything else, without a plan to get and remain healthy, you can't hit the goal. That's why I'm so thrilled to be partnering with Life Force, it's co-founded by my good friend Tony Robbins and Peter Diamandis. Life Force is a leader in proactive care. The Life Force membership includes everything you need to understand your wellness and help you make good decisions today that keep you on track in the future for your health. Listeners of my show get $250 when they first sign up for their membership by going to mylifeforce.com/ed. That's mylifeforce.com. Slash Ed. Take control of your wellness with Life Force and see what the healthiest version of you actually looks like and is capable of. These products and statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. At the beginning of the book, guys, there's this unbelievable story about your last conversation with Kobe Bryant, just your relationship with him, because I think a winner, I do think of Kobe and MJ, sure. 11 championships between them. Tell everybody a little bit about that conversation. You know, Kobe and I. We text often. He was no longer playing. Ba- he was no longer playing basketball. Mm-hmm. He had moved into the business world. Mm-hmm. Already won an Oscar. Wrote an amazing children's book. And we text back and forth. We tried to see each other. He was busy. I was busy. And I'd say, "How you doing?" He'd be, "I'm good. How you doing?" And we, I'm chasing the next win. He's chasing the next win. And we were going to get together. The All Star Game was going to be in Chicago. And our plan was he was going to come in town, mm-hmm. you know, to support and some business stuff and so forth. So we had planned uh, 
get together. And uh, he said, he'll text me when I'm in town. I said, hey, I'm not going anywhere. And mm. Sorry, brother. I'm the only guy who gets Tim Grover to cry mm-hmm. on the show. You're good. It never happened. Yeah. It never happened. He said something to you at the end of that conversation too, right? About something about winning or I'm gonna keep winning or something like that. It actually came Chasing up the next win. Chasing the next win. Chasing the next win. What was it like for you, Tim? Because obviously the emotion on your face is, like, this is not Tim. You're not, a, you're not a crier. No. What, I'm curious what, when you heard the news originally, by the way, I was with him the week before. Is that crazy? I'll have to tell you that in a minute. But um, did you just not believe it? Or was it just like the breath left your body? Or So what happened was, you know, I get, I get some information. Somebody shoots me a text. I was like, oh, fake news. This is not true. This is not mm-hmm. true. And then more media comes in, more media come. Then people that were like really close to him, like out in the L.A. area and so forth said, hey, I just want to let you know that this is, and I was like, it, it, it can't be. Mm-hmm. It can't be. It didn't hit me until like three days later. Really? Three days. I was just like literally sleeping. And I got up in the middle of the night. And I was just like, he's gone. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you just didn't want to believe it. Mm-hmm. You, just, you just didn't want to believe it. Do you think, because obviously you being a, such a close confidant of his, and I get what you mean, like time happens in life. You don't text in every single day. You're both busy guys, but yeah. you don't have to when you're great friends. You and I, even we text a lot, but even we don't for a month or two, it's like right, right it's back. It's not personal. Right. It's never personal. Like right. you're busy. Hey, your success comes in, send your thumbs up. Everybody, yeah. you, you, you don't have to text anybody when they know that you're actually excited for every win they get and every win that you get right you're like they they already know you they already know you're there for them. now when they do something exceptional you're like hey i just saw what you did or mm. something funny but yeah exactly i think something with him like because it grips so many people that are even basketball fans i think it's when someone lives so full out that when they're no longer living the impact of that passing is greater for some reason you know yeah. I mean, he was so alive so to make the transition from winning on the basketball court to winning in the business environment and then he got it you got a chance to see you know when he was no longer that basketball player how close he was with his family yeah you know how he supported how he supported everyone you know his daughter's basketball games and the volleyball games and everything and it was just like he was a much approachable person you know everybody used to see this rigid individual on the on yeah. the court and he was so much he was smiling and he was talking to other players and so forth i always say that his next move his next win was he had two things he wanted to do and i have no proof of this but just knowing mm-hmm. his mentality one was he wanted his daughter to be the first female to play in the NBA. No kidding. Not the WNBA, no the kidding. NBA. Wow. That's what he was getting, wow. her, that's what he was getting her ready for. Mm. And the second one was like, he was like, I already own LA from a basketball standpoint. Mm. I want to race the basketball thing. I want to own LA. No kidding. He was that driven to continue to win. Yes. Which is a theme in the book. See, I'm going to tell you, you'd be proud of him, by the way, because I know you were, there's intermittent, and I did not know Kobe well. But our daughters played in the same volleyball league. So the week before he passed, we were in the same gym. I remember you telling this story. Yeah, three, and ends up, these volleyball tournaments are long, as you know, being a volleyball dad, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, they are. But anyway, long story short, there's three dads left. It's almost 10 o'clock at night left in this gym. Mm-hmm. Me, him, and another dude who's a good friend of mine. And it was just striking for me. I watched this, it's the Black Mamba, man. This dude's a killer, right? Yeah. But I watched him, and I have no idea why. It like really struck me. I'm always evaluating him. You and I talk about it. Yeah. Am I a good dad? How's your daughter? You know, like we're always evaluating these things. And, and I watched him, other end of the gym, I watched him with his daughter, and he's carrying the baby in his one arm. And just uh, the game was over, and he was like kind of just caressing his other daughter's back, just watching him. I remember literally going, I don't hug Bella enough. Like, I don't hug her enough, you know? 
and he was such, I mean, because he's a man, he's a flawed man. This guy had, he really changed, you yes. know? And that's something to be so proud of. Anyway, long story short, because that, to me that's winning. Winning is improvement, winning is growing, winning is ultimately, he was a better man on his last day than he was in the middle of his career. Great, right? and when you said flawed, everybody thinks of flawed as a negative. We're all flawed. Right. We are all flawed. Accept it, use it, learn from it, mm. and be like, okay, this is of who I am. This is who I am. I'm not trying to be somebody else. What's, what's your flaws that what makes you exceptional? That what make you different. That's mm. what allows you to win where other people don't want to win, mm. is the people that can say, hey, we're flawed. We've both wrote bestseller books mm -hmm. and people won't know this about it. they know this about me but you shared this mm -hmm. when we were at uh Arte syndicate one yeah. time you can't spell <laughs> <laughs> that's totally true and i can't either <laughs> that's such a great point yeah. okay those are our flaws and what do we do we just laugh at it we write best-selling books yes we laugh. We, we, i never even thought of that we, we laugh at it i got knocked out in a spelling bee which is in the book yep. and the word they asked me to spell was ham <laughs> 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 That's so awesome, dude. Yeah. That's so Damn. awesome. Right. It's so awesome. I'm crying. So you cried on sad stuff. I cry on funny <laughs> stuff. No, I just, I just, you know, I think about it, man. Like you say something in the book. There's all these lessons, and they're all listed like as number one, which right. I like too. He's like, hey, there's not 21. There's not 28. There's like, there's just an unlimited list of things yes. compiled on this book and winning. And it made me think of Kobe because, you know, when he walked out of the gym that day, I've said mm -hmm. this to you too, but. He had six days left to live. And I just, you know, what if the world would have, if he could just have a whisper when he got into that car with his family that night, Kobe, six days left to live. Yeah. Three days later, Kobe, three more days. Three more days. That Saturday prior, Kobe, one more. day left. You know, and the one thing I do feel like about people that win is in the book, because Kobe was doing this to the very end. You talk about the sprint versus marathon thing on winning. Just yes. talk about that, because I think Kobe did that till right in the last moment. Right, at, right yeah. at the end. You know, Kobe had this great line that he used to use all the time. He goes, rest at the end, not in the middle. Mm. Rest at the end, not in the middle. Mm. So to me, life and winning is a bunch of sprints within a marathon. Mm. You know? That's a fact. Yeah a bunch of sprints within a marathon. And you can't see the end line. Like in a marathon, you know where the end line is. In winning, that win, that race may have an end line, but there's another start line right after it. Yeah. And for people that are really driven, and this is, just, this is not about money, and this isn't about fame. This is about, you could be winning as a school teacher. You could be winning as an entrepreneur. You could be winning in business. You could be winning as an athlete, uh, as a waiter, whatever it is, a waitress, whatever it is. It's that every single time you sprint to that finish line, there's another start line that's coming. <laughs> and that's why it never ends. It's a marathon that just keeps going, going, and going. And I try to tell people, listen, I'm not an avid runner. I used to be in my much younger days, not avid. I used to enjoy it. You see the times of the, the best marathons, they're running. Insane. 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 They're it's, basically sprinting. They, they're basically, they're, yeah. they're sprinting. Yeah. They are, they are sprinting. I think that's, uh, it's one of the things, Tim, that you, you say in the book that I think is like super profound is that I think a lot of people like think there's some pacing to winning, but the truth is there's not really pacing, is there? The best are full speed, knowing it's a long race, but it's, there's only really one gear for them. Or am I wrong about that? No, no, you're absolutely, yeah. you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. But everyone looks at the physical condition are you mentally prepared to sprint every single day? Hmm. Are you mentally prepared to sprint every single day and for how long? Because somebody else is sprinting. Hmm. You don't want them to get what, be, what should be your win ends up being somebody else's win. Hmm. And everyone who says hard work, no, we'll get you closer to that win. How many individuals have you known that you've outworked 
and they got that win. Yeah, right. Winning has no loyalty to you. It has no loyalty to me. It has no loyalty to anybody. Mm. You can outwork somebody. You can outstudy them. Mm. All right, you can do all these different things. Yeah. You can apply for a, a job, and somebody who's less qualified ends up getting that job. So winning has no loyalty, loyalty to you. It's this is like, here it is. This is where the book is so. I, I call it like hardcore because that's your style that's, too. Yeah. It's like look. There's so many things in the book where you talk like that about, you know, hey, listen, winning doesn't care about you. Winning, winning will lift you up and then slap you back down again, right? Yeah. There's all of these unbelievable, and I think as somebody who wants to win more, I've done some winning, who wants to win more, when you read it, if you've had any wins in your life, you, confirmation of truth, when you read something that you know is true, it just instantly sits on you as a fact, right? Yeah. And so, here's one of the things you say in the book, you say, I man, all over the book, I'm highlighting and writing stuff down. For people I know, for myself, I read this to Max last night, about 1 a.m. He goes, Dad, he said, I said, wake up, I'm reading Grover's book. He's like, bring it back with you tonight, which yeah. I'm gonna do, but. No, you give him this one. Okay, I will, give him the yeah, clean give, one. Give Thank that. you. Winning requires you to be different, and different scares people. So if you're worried about what others will say, the long-term effects, the sacrifices you make, the sleep you lose, your family being angry, I can't help you with that. There's nothing, quote, typical about lifestyle and choices you have to make. Winning is, an inside, winning is inside all of us, but for most, that's where it will stay. Trapped under a lifetime of fear and worry and doubt. The race, to speak of the sprint, to greatness has no rules to protect you. Nothing says you're gonna lose. You're gonna get, to, you're not gonna get, nothing says you're not gonna lose. Nothing says you're not gonna get hurt. You're not gonna do all this work for nothing. There's no guarantee it'll be fair. Most likely, it will not be fair. You'll lose at the buzzer. You'll lose to someone who didn't work as hard as you did. you lose on a bad call or a bad place. Someone else will get the job. A pandemic will wipe out your season, your bank account, your career. Yet, the prize at the end of that race remains so compelling, so addictive, so gorgeous, we keep running and stumbling and sacrificing and competing to catch it. It's exactly what you're talking about, right? It's exactly what I'm talking about. Hmm. You just, it's... I couldn't describe it any other way. You just look at it. It's not, everybody said, how many times you've heard it? It's not fair. It's not supposed to be fair. <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not supposed to be fair. Winning is not supposed to be fair. Life is not fair. There's nothing that's going to guarantee you that win. It's, but the only thing that's going to guarantee you that loss is if you don't get in this race. How many people, and you talk about this all the time, about the fears and the emotions and the, like, you know, just... Mm -hmm getting, just going for it, just like here it is. Mm. Look at yourself. Mm. You've moved three different times in probably the last six months mm. for whatever reasons you've had, all right? And you've literally packed up and moved, like here I'm going, here I'm going, here. You got people that won't move themselves out of a chair. And you've literally moved families, yeah. lives, play, mm. and, and there's literally a fear behind every single one of those, but there was no doubt. Right, that's really well said. There was no doubt. That's really Everything well said. that you've done, and everything that I've done, there's always been a little fear, and the fear is what allows us to be like, you know what, I'm gonna throw myself over the ledge. Mm. I'm, go I'm, going, I'm going to do this, but I have no doubt mm of what the end result is going to be. That's so amazing you say, I was with a group of guys, influencers, one of them you were with this morning, about four weeks ago, and kind of went around the table like, what moves you? And one guy's like, hey, my dreams, you know, my confidence, my this. And so it got to me, and I think probably at that, well, anyway, I'll just say that at that table, I kind of, I said, hey, I'll be honest with you, I'm still afraid. I'm still afraid. They're like, you're afraid, you got this, you got that. I said, no, man, I'm still afraid. And it's a real afraid. It's not something I'm trying to conjure up. It's like a real afraid that I have. However, I actually think successful people have this really unique nuance of like tons of self-confidence combined with enough humility to want to keep working and learning. It's a really unique, we both know people that are super confident but don't have that dose of humility where yep. they want to work hard and want to be coached, right? And then you also have the people with all the humility in the world but they don't have the confidence and they're not going to win either, right? And you have, you coach, Mm -hmm. people at all different levels. Mm -hmm. Your most successful people are your most coachable. A fact. 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 What about when you would train Kobe, you say something in the book, like when you first met him, the first workouts mm -hmm. or whatever, like he didn't want you to make it easy on him. He had no expectation. No, that, right? I mean, just like, hey, listen. And the thing that he said was unique about this, 
when we were starting to work out, one of the reporters asked him, said, oh, you hired uh, Tim Grover, Michael, Michael's training. He goes, well, what, do you, what have you, how do you feel about that? Kobe, and I'm gonna use a little language here. Yeah. He goes, I don't know, he ain't done shit for me. Mm. Mm. He goes, I'm not gonna judge him by what he did mm. last time. Mm. I wanna know what he's, done, what he's done for me. We relish that. Yeah, you, do you relish what Jordan told him about you? Oh, yes. Tell him, it's okay, tell the language. Remember yeah. what Jordan said about you to him? Yeah, so he just said. <laughs> Kobe asked him, what about this guy? What about, he goes, he really knows his stuff, but he goes, he's the biggest asshole you'll ever meet. <laughs> it's a great compliment, it's right? It's a great compliment. It's a great compliment because how many people, when, they're, when they meet winners, yep. fold. Yeah. They become yes men, mm-hmm. yes people. Yes, yep, right? exactly. And then you have to be the person that holds them accountable. And it's funny, I just, as you said earlier, I call people out, on, I, I want people to call me out on my bullshit, yeah. I call them out on their bullshit. Yep. You've done it with me before. Yeah, I have, I, yeah. I, do, I do it with everyone, and I yeah. do it not out of a place out of hate, not jealous or anything like that. Listen, the one thing that you've offered me that no one's ever offered me, Mm-hmm. <laughs> is your is an access to your jet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Now, if I would have came when I put you in check, if that was coming out of hate, that offer wouldn't be there. Mm-hmm. You know it's coming out of love. A hundred percent. By the way, you also have helped my son unselfishly. And by the way, never told me that you were doing it. Only through him do I find these things out that Tim does. That's what I meant by a real man. I think the winners have this thing. By the way, you should use it. You're the type of person that will never take me up on it, and you should. But I have to tell you guys that I think one of the things that the winners have is they lose this expectation that's going to be easy. They lose the expectation that they're going to be liked. They lose the expectation that it's gonna be perfect. Like, once you've sort of given up, you've actually surrendered to the fact, this is not going to be easy, people aren't going to like me, I am going to be judged, I am going to be disliked. It's not all that bad when it starts happening to you. And that's what winning's about. That, in order to win, you have, those are all the things that are in the unforgiving race. So you already know they're there. <laughs> you know they're there. Mm. And then people are still distracted by it. You know everything that you just mentioned is in this race. Mm-hmm. So if you already know it's there, you know what your opponents are. Deal with it. You also though, like there's a level even past that. Like every time I'm reading the book, I'm like, okay, oh, there's another level, another level, another level. And you articulate it. You've been up close and you're including yourself to like the biggest winners in, in sports. So like there's layers to this that only someone in that type of proximity to it would know too. But I, so many people are governed, like what we're really describing right now is they're governed by their emotions. Yes. Their emotions rule their lives, right? And you talk in the book about mindset and thoughts being bigger and more important than that. So this is so huge what he's about to share with you right now, because right now, some of you, this, you're driving right now, or you're on a treadmill somewhere, or you're watching this on YouTube, and you're being governed by your emotions. It's literally dictating the direction of your life, your effort, your belief level, your confidence, all of it. But the highest level winners do what? Your mind has to be stronger than your feelings. Mm. Your mind has to be stronger than your feelings. Think about every poor decision you've made in your life. Gosh. There was more emotion that was involved in it than there was mind. Every single one of them. Think about it. It really was. Your feelings Mm. keep you in bed. Mm. Your mind tells you, get up. Mm. Mm. Think about it. Every single day, your mind is the one that tells you, get up. And your feelings like, eh, an extra 30 minutes, just roll this, don't worry about it. Mm. Well. I, I could tell you this, every bad decision I've made has been ruled by emotion. Guess you what? You just said that. You, you and I have both. Yeah. You, you and I both. Mm. Every, so you're making me think. Every single one. Your mind has to be stronger than your feelings. Listen, it's not the popular decision. Mm. You are going to hurt. You are going to piss a lot of people off. Yep. All right. Are you gonna piss them off for the short term? Are you gonna piss them off for the long term? I've had so many individuals, athletes, that I used to train back in the day, and I used to tell them, you're not good enough to go to the NBA. Mm. You would evaluate them and be willing to tell them. I would say, you're not good enough to, but you can make a ton of money overseas. Mm. I said, what do you wanna do? I said, overseas, you can make, I said, you can literally, you Mm. could have a very long career, be extremely, 
popular over there, mm. live a nice lifestyle, and be successful for numerous years. Mm. Grover, you don't know what you're talking about. Mm. Da -da. Okay, I'm telling you. 10 years come by, they're chasing the NBA dream. They don't make it. I run into them and they come up to me and says, you're the only one that told me. Mm. You're mm. the only one that told me. Do you think the fact that they deny is an interesting thought? Like you are candid with me, right? Like I, I actually look at, my dad was candid with me. So I, maybe it's because I played sports, I don't know, but like I look at people who are really candid and frank with me as like that's actually real belief in love. 100%. But don't you think most people that don't win, and I'm not calling myself a winner, but I think most people that don't win don't view candor and direct feedback that way. They view it as hate or criticism or you, you're, you're rooting against me or, don't you agree? Like I actually have very few people who are candid with me. Yeah. And those are some of my most cherished people in my life. Right. Well, here's the thing. So when's the right, when's the, when's the best time for the truth? All the time. It's the best time for the truth, all the time. The truth should lead to more action. Hmm. But what does it usually do? It leads to more emotions. Hmm. So wow, you somebody, that's really true. So when you tell somebody the truth, so what's the first thing, anybody in a relationship, you go in a relationship with business, personal, whatever it is, the first thing they always ask me, honesty. Honesty is the most important, until you're honest. Until you're honest, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Then the emotions get in, and then everything goes haywire. Then your mind start, your mind has to be stronger than your feelings. That's awesome. Someone said to you, because I think, like, it's rare that you put someone who's the best on the planet at something in front of you. Like, on the earth spinning right now. And we said, who in the last 25 years, let's say, take that window of time, just that basic window of time, which is a fair window. Who's probably the healthiest, fittest person, the icon that's sustained it, grown it, and gotten more fit, and also helped more people get there too that he trains with? It would be this human, right, sitting next to me. So what does that, I know we've talked a lot about it, but like if, it's hard to describe yourself. I have a hard time doing it. It's like, I'm not yeah. even sure how I am. You know, I'm just that way, right? But let me ask you something, seriously. What's that mindset like, like, don't sugarcoat it, no BS, don't be humble. Is it just like you want to crush everybody? Is it you're trying to chase the best you? Is it just like this stacking of disciplines that's built you into this thing? Like, what is it that's like this world-class mindset you hold? Do you know? Um, I would say it's, it's, I want to be the very, the number one guy. I want people to be able to say, hey, I want to do a Mike O'Hearn. I want to mm. be like Mike O'Hearn mm. when I'm that. Mm. And, 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 and that whatever is, it is. It just... It, that long period of time. Yeah. And, and it's not just, I don't want you guys to sit there and I, I guess I want people to live what I've lived and, and stop giving the excuses and stop saying, uh, I'm 30 now, it's downhill from here. Well, That's pretty peaked. good. College, I peaked yeah. and then it's that. Yeah. It's like, there's a, there's a thing called science and, and there's a science will show you what's possible, what's not possible. There is something that's called heart that can break that and something that can set it apart. And I'm just saying that the one thing that we're doing now, and, and, and I'm lucky enough to be around, is to be around doctors and science and actually doing tests now going, why is, why is it that I got to be able to do this for such a long period of time and not just as a average Joe, because mm -hmm. everybody's like, as long as I can be healthy, mm -hmm. fuck healthy, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. It's all right. It's Bleep okay. that out. But okay. be a freaking superhero for your whole life. Yes. And then, so I guess for me, it's consistency is me describing myself, mm -hmm. um, but the hunger to be the very number one. Yes, so. yes. What's the next uh, five or 10 years look like for you, do you think? We know uh, what the past looked like, we know what the present looks like. What, but when we're, we're gonna do more of these, but I'm gonna have you back here yeah, in five years. I think, uh, what do you think? I love the um, purchasing properties and commercial real estate. I okay. love this, and it's something that, again, I think you agree with this. Yeah. You can be around uh, your friends, but you need some elite people that are raising you up. And, and I've yes. got that and I've had yep. that. Um, in the last 10 years, my life has completely changed to the mm -hmm. point of where uh, I'm doing all charity and, mm -hmm. and I'm around guys that are better than me yeah, in other me facets. Me and, and they make you stand up and go, listen, this, yep. this is great yep. what you're doing, but I need you here. Yes. This is what you need to do. Now yep. you need to man we up. You all need so, these people in your life. Yeah. And so I, I you buy I've more got property. That. You think we, we think we're seeing movies? More, more properties, uh, leads in movies, um, and continue to travel the world and talk. Yeah. Um, do you think you'd be even more fit? I do. I, I, listen, I'm I'm 
as much as I got crazy this year, I already yeah. told my girl, and I said, I want to even be better than I was for New Year's. I love this, brother. I so, love, you inspire me. Thanks, man. No, you inspire me. You do. Like, Appreciate you're, you're that. You're inspiring to me. This is, I can that's, tell you see, that's, a, that's a fun, that's a fun love. Oh, is this your ride? Yeah, this is how you're getting home. <laughs> Helicopter's coming in, guys. Home. Right over the ocean. Um, yeah, we're gonna do more of this. Yeah. This went too fast, but I just something that, when you can push somebody that's already at a yep. pinnacle level, yep. that's badass. It is badass, and that's why I try to surround myself with guys like you, and like you just said, that's such a that's part of the formula, everybody, is that you surround yourself with people who do make you better. Whatever the industry is, it doesn't even matter. They just make you want to be better by their example, not their yelling and screaming, uh, right? Their example thank you does. Thank saying that. That's though. a fact. The other thing I want to tell everybody that when you're listening to Mike, there's a uniqueness to him that I want to point out. It's that not only can he do these things, but he can articulate them. That's rare for an athlete. It's rare for a business person to be able to articulate it. The reason I point that out to you is you can get Mike to come speak to your organization. You can have him come talk to your group. He can come do, he can do inspirational talks, fitness talks. This is someone that you ought to bring into your company to have speak to you. And he's also somebody that just by following him on social media will alter your life. You, you will have no excuses. You will be inspired, right? You will see one of the great lives being lived, but there's also all this fitness stuff, all this information out there.